uh, it could be also uh, facilitated by uh, place evaluation. Thank you, Ayman. I appreciate the introduction. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to do a little section on herbicide resistant weeds here. We have two presentations lined up for you on uh, the finger weeder cultivation and then spot spray technology. Uh, but I want to give you just a little introduction and, and idea of where we're, what we're working on and why we're working on this. As many of you know already, <clears throat> it's no surprise to most of you that uh, Palmer amaranth in particular is kind of running rampant through our, our field crop production acreage here in central Arizona. Uh, but that's not it. It's, it's actually from, from southeast to west where all of our production areas have pretty much been in, inundated by some way, shape or form by herbicide resistant weeds. And the more herbicide resistant weeds we get, we just uh, lose a tool in our, in our toolbox and, and makes everything a little bit more, more difficult to control and a little bit more expensive to control. Uh, and with, with the way everything is, crop prices, well, crop prices aren't so bad right now, but uh, operation costs are going up. And you know the bottom line is to try to make a profit where we can, otherwise we're not gonna do business very long. So uh, to control this Palmer amaranth in particular, uh, we've, we've kind of lost control of it, I think, uh, to some extent. There's huge populations uh, in Marana, in Coolidge. There, I know there's some in Stanfield. I've seen quite a few populations in, around, in and around Casa Grande, and it seems to grow more and more rapidly every year. Uh, I've been around now. I think this is my fifth cotton season. And while there was some five years ago, it, it wasn't nearly as widespread as it is today. <clears throat> and this plant, uh, just to give you an idea of the beast that we're dealing with, this plant is, it's a, a C4 plant. It grows at approximately 2.3 times the rate of your cotton crop. So that's why when you see your seedlings in the ground and you have germination with your cotton seedlings and Palmer amaranth at similar time, those Palmer amaranth plants just jump out of the ground and, and just shade them out and suck all the nutrients and water away from your cotton crop. So if you're not getting on top of those plants early to kill them, and if they're round resistant, herbicide resistant, then you're gonna be in a, a world of pain. So one of these plants, uh, if a big, big female is kind of growing by herself, she can produce up to 1.5 million seeds, one individual plant. Uh, so you can imagine if you have, a, have several of these big resistant plants throughout your field, you're gonna have, you're gonna have a full field of Palmer amaranth in, in no time flat. Uh, some research that's been done shows that a small population in year one that's unmanaged and allowed to spread turns into approximately a 20% uh, infestation the second year. And then the third year, we're seeing 100% crop loss. So uh, it's, 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 it's incredible how fast this, this weed and this pest can run through your field and just annihilate your production. <clears throat> So we've, uh, long time Bill's talked about the strategies for controlling this pest. I, oh, sorry, no, I don't have any slides. I just wanted to give an introduction, Peter. Uh, I mean, you wanna stop sharing so at least everyone can see me? I don't know if that's a, a, a pro or a con seeing me, but it is what it is. Okay. Um, but no, I don't have any slides. I just wanted to give an introduction. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, <clears throat> So we have uh, Bill's, Bill's talk countless times about effective tactics to work on this, on this problem, on this pest. We really need to identify early. If you have a small patch in that field, you gotta get on it, jump right on it and, and pull it out, rip it out, do whatever you have to. Our pre-emergent pre -emergent herbicides work incredibly well on this, on Palmer amaranth. Um, just putting them out and, and incorporating them pre-plant devastates the population of Palmer amaranth and really allows you to control it. <clears throat> and then rotating your chemistries. You know, don't rely on one chemistry time and time and time again, which kind of happened with uh, glyphosate, which is why we're, why we're kind of reeling it, reeling not having it. So, and then, and, you know, cultivation, while we're not, lots of people sold off their cultivation equipment years ago. Uh, I worked with a grower this spring who wanted to put pre-emergent down, but didn't have any way to incorporate it in the soil other than just irrigating it in. But, you know, getting back to, if you know you have a problem, getting back to cultivation is, 
is a, is a really strong way to control that population. And of course, eradicating any escapes. Uh, that not only includes in your crop, in your, uh, in your cotton crop or alfalfa crop, it also includes around your, your equipment yard. It includes ditch banks, roadsides, anywhere where you have escaped weeds. Uh, just, you gotta control them. Um, it's, it's slowly slipping away, and, and, but we still have time, I believe, I really do. So a lot of those tactics I just mentioned are gonna, are gonna be displayed for you today. Uh, cultivation, you know, standard cultivation is, is great. Uh, Mark is gonna go over some cultivation equipment that is gonna get you closer to the plant. And it's also gonna be able to take out some of those weeds that are in your crop row. Uh, Pedro is gonna discuss uh, spot spray or uh, sea and spray technology that'll be able to, you know, open up your bag of, of tricks to, to take out this, this pest. So with that, I'd like, to, I'd like to welcome in our first speaker on this topic, Mark Siemens. Uh, you may have seen this finger weeder before. We've shown it at a couple different meetings in the past, but I just, uh, we wanted to get it, get it out to you guys again so you could see the technology, see how it's working. And then secondly, we're gonna follow up with Pedro Andrade and that, and that spray technology. So I appreciate you guys listening. Uh, this is, this is a, kind of one of the top priorities on my list. Uh, I've just seen it spread so much over the past years, and I feel it's one of our most important, uh, one of our most important pests right now. And we really need to, we need everybody to work together to get on it. Uh, Naomi just posted in the chat box a, a IPM short on control that I wrote with Bill and Naomi and maybe some, several other people. Uh, please take a look at it, read it over. And then shortly later on this year or early at the end of this year, we're going to put out a chemistry list uh, for different lay by tech or different lay by sprays and pre emergence and kind of an all inclusive herbicide list. So, again, I, I thank you guys all for listening to me. Uh, I hope that you guys are all taking this, this past really, really seriously out in the field. And we, we need to do everything that we can, including chopping, chopping them down uh, to control it. All right, so Mark, if you're ready, I'd invite you to share your screen and take it away. I am ready. Can you can you guys see my screen? I'm just seeing kind of a gray box. Gray box. That's mm -hmm. good. Uh, news. I can. How about now? There you go. Now it looks good. All right. Okay, how does it look now? You want to put it on the screen mode. The, okay. Let's see. Display settings. Okay. Well, um, yeah, thanks for having me. And thank you, Blaze, for that great introduction. I think it's a real good segue for what I'm going to talk about, which is precision cultivation technologies for uh, trying to improve our weed control efficacy in cotton. So as Blaze mentioned, uh, Palmer amaranth and other herbicides, herbicide weeds are uh, increasingly problematic in Arizona. And cultivation is a pretty effective management tool, um, there, there are some limitations with uh, conventional cultivators. One is they only control the weeds in between the uh, crop rows. They don't control the weeds in, uh, in between individual plants uh, within the seed row. The other is uh, they have poor lateral preci uh, precision in that um, there's only so close you can get the cultivating tools to the crop plant without actually injuring the crop plant. So the, the tools we're looking at um, are, I, I call them new here, but they're not uh, actually new. Um, the first is finger weeders. And finger weeders have been around for a long time. I think they were uh, patented back in the 50s and are, are still around. Mark, are you, know, advancing? Mark, are you advancing your slide? I should be. Because we cannot see it because they are not on the presentation mode. You want to like have it as a slideshow? I'm not in the present. It's showing as a presentation 
on my screen. So yeah. We had this. We had this same problem in this morning's meeting. Uh, what we had to do was go out of presentation mode and then just kind of click through them. I don't know if it's a new problem or what. So it was the same exact problem. Yeah, my problem is I, I have two screens, um, which might be part of the problem. Between yep. the screen. So I'm sorry. Mark, if you want to, if you want to stop sharing this screen and then put your presentation in presentation mode and then go back to share screen and you can select the presentation mode, that screen. All right. Run that by me one more time, please. So stop share. Okay. And then put your presentation in presentation mode so it's on one of your screens. Okay. And then do share screen again and select that screen, the one that is in presentation mode. Okay. Uh-oh. Am I still there? You look good. We got you now. Who needs IT good. when we have Kyle? Yeah. yeah. Man behind the screen. Oh my gosh. Pay no attention to the man behind the screen. Okay. Gosh, my screen keeps glitching on me. Is it glitching on for you guys? Mine keeps coming in and out of um uh... looks good on this end. There is only this like uh, gray square on the top. Now it's gone. Okay, screen sharing has stopped because the external display is disconnected. All right, let me try one more thing. screen okay how's how's that that's good oh good all right so uh finger weeders um they are like i said they've been around for a long time it's basically a, a fingered wheel made of flexible rubber and you position these wheels uh kind of adjacent to each other with the finger weeders overlapping a little bit uh, right on the seed line. And the way it works is you have some uh, opening, some discs out in front, which open a furrow. They leave a uncultivated strip um, in between the two wheels. And then the wheels are, are ground driven. And as they are move forward and, and spin, they kind of crumble or um, till uh, the soil in between um the two wheels right in within the seed line without <coughs> um injuring the uh, uprooting the plant so kind of a unique feature or interesting design feature of these finger weeders is that they're uh ground driven by steel pins and the diameter of the uh, or the circumference of the wheel that these uh, steel pins are on is slightly smaller than that of the uh, finger weeders. So the uh, ground speed of the finger weeders at the tips themselves is slightly faster than your forward speed of the tractor. So um, th that causes a little bit of uh, uh, increased agitation and does a better job of uh, removing weeds. So let me see. Oops. Okay. So the other technology we're investigating is again, not old um, or new. Um, these are uh, camera guided side shift uh, hitch systems. And basically they're comprised of two components. The, the uh, one side of the hitch is attached to the tractor and that's the fixed component. And the backside of the hitch is attached to your implement and the, the back side of the uh, hitch can move uh, side to side relative to the front part. The system uses a, a camera based imaging system to detect the crop, crop rows. 
And all right. And that information is fed to a onboard computer uh, that you uh, can mount in your tractor cab and control the uh, position of the hitch automatically. Should have a video here. Let's see. Is the video playing? No. Nope. Well, that's gonna. You need to hit the play thing. Should start automatically. Yeah, go ahead and try and hit the play button. It's not. Interesting. Maybe try hitting the space bar. No, yeah. so that'll. Yeah, that's something with the video itself. Um, uh -oh. Share screen. Should I? Maybe. Whoops. Back to Zoom. Let's see if I can do it this way. Okay. That's interesting. So if you have the file um, readily available where that video file is, um, most university computers come with VLC media. So if you can find that file and right click and do open with VLC media and that player, and then you can share the screen of that video player. All right. Shoot, shoot. Okay. Um. All right, try it. At this point, we might have to just keep going because we're gonna we're burning up some time. All right. Okay. We could attach the video in the, <laughs> the in the newsletter. All right. Open with the. Uh, how do you say to open it? Thank you. Guys. So if you right click on the file and then there should be an option of open with. Right. And then it'll open up another category. It, it looks like a little uh, construction cone, VLC, Victor Lima Charlie. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing that. So shoot. Okay. You can try QuickTime Media or uh, Windows Media, see if it'll. But generally, if it's not going to play in PowerPoint, sometimes it, it, there's something wrong with the file. Let's, continue, let's continue with the presentation, and then we can provide either link or file for this video. Yeah. Okay. Well, what the? Am I back sharing my screen? Or not? Not yet. Okay. All right. So yeah, what the go. video was gonna show was uh, how the the side shift hitch system actually worked. Um, basically, it, it moves a, a inch or two side to side, and it, it was pretty impressive how much it actually. Uh, I was kind of surprised how much it actually moved on a on a regular basis. So the uh, third technology we're looking at is um, what I'm sure you're pretty familiar with, and that is uh, auto steered tractors. Here the idea is to use uh, uh, auto steering to uh, improve the steering capability and position the cultivating tools a little bit closer to the crop row itself and um, control a, a few more weeds. 
So the, the um, treatments we've been looking at over the course of the last three years are listed on the screen. Um, what we're, uh, the first one is the conventional cultivator where we have the, um, um, uh, cultivating tools uh, positioned about eight to 10 inches apart. So our uncultivated band is consequently eight to 10 inches. The second system, we had the tools placed about six inches apart and we tested this with and without the finger weeders. The third system would be the camera guided side shift system, which left a three and a half inch cultivated band. And we tested this uh, with and without finger weeders. Again, the idea uh, behind this, this project was to try and um, control weeds without herbicides. And as such, we need to go in pretty early when the cotton is uh, some in the two to four leaf stage and try and control these small weeds with uh, pillage. And the ones we're most interested in trying to control are the um, ones close to the crop plant. So looks like this video would not play. Um, I think what we'll do is uh, probably upload uh, these to a YouTube video so you can see them. Uh, I, I'd encourage you to, if you're- Try. What's that? <laughs> I didn't. Well, then I have zero appetite for dinner because it's all the first time I've been trying. <laughs> I purposely didn't mm, watch those. Oh. So. All right, I'm back. Hello? You're back. Okay. So what I was saying was, yeah, well, I think what we'll do is we'll upload these to YouTube or, or something and provide you all with the link and I encourage you to, if you're interested in this sort of thing, to, to uh, view these videos. Uh, it's pretty impressive um, um, what they do and pretty informative. So let's see. Gosh, this is new technology. So I have a series of videos here incorporated in the PowerPoint, um, which unfortunately you're not able to see, but each of the uh, four different treatments uh, with and without finger weeders. Um, but fortunately I have this slide. Uh, this, these, this slide shows what the treatments look like um, after tillage. So in the upper left-hand corner is the auto steer tractor, leaving a six inch uncultivated band. In the lower right-hand corner is the device, um, uh, same setup uh, using the finger weeders. And this is the camera guided shift, uh, side shift system, again, with and without finger weeders in our control or our, our conventional, in this case, it, was a, a Lewiston uh, with Alabama sweeps on it. Here are some of the results from the study. I picked this particular data set out of the three years uh, of work we've done with these systems because it, it pretty much shows, um, uh, represents what we found and um, um, kind of tells a pretty good story. So there's, a lot of data on this slide. So what I'd like to do is have you focus on the, the column on the right. And what we're finding is there really isn't much advantage to using the GPS RTK uh, system, the auto steer on the uh, tractor as compared to uh, conventional. Where we did see a, a pretty big difference was um, using the camera guided chip uh, side shift. <laughs> Uh, system. Here we're seeing about a 32% uh, increase in uh, uh, or improvement in weed control. And uh, that makes sense if you if you think about it. Our, uh, what we've done is we've reduced our uncultivated band from six inches down to three and a half. That's about a 40% reduction. And so basically if you're reducing your uncultivated band, you get that much better weed control. And that's um, numerically 
correlating pr pretty much with the data we're collecting. Other thing I'd like to draw your attention to is that when used in conjunction with finger readers, uh, the camera guided side shift system was pretty effective at controlling uh, small uh, broadleaf weeds. Here we're getting uh, uh, better than 90% control. Uh, the system was uh, moderately effective at controlling uh, grassy type weeds. Um, question is, how good uh, did the finger weeders perform? Well, for um, uh, some of our broadleaf weeds that are have a, a taproot, uh, the system was uh, pretty effective, uh, somewhere between 30% uh, and 50% uh, weed control. Uh, just using the, uh, with the finger weeders. The system, uh, finger weeders weren't all that effective on uh, purslane. It's uh, more of a well-rooted uh, type weed. Same with grassy weeds, uh, uh, with deep-rooted or, or well-rooted weeds, the, the system just isn't aggressive enough to dislodge those weeds. So, um, here again, uh, point I'd like to make is that uh, finger weeders with finger weeders, um, uh, timing is really critical for good performance. Uh, biggest size weed you could probably be able to control with finger weeders is probably in the uh, up to maybe four or five leaf stage. And again, that's because the finger weeders essentially just disrupt or dislodge the soil uh, within the plant line, you can't be too aggressive with it or it's going to uproot the uh, young, young plants. Uh, as far as crop safety, when you compare the treatments with and without the finger weeders, you really don't see uh, much difference. And we really didn't see much difference in um, uh, reduction in our, our crop stand uh, as compared to the conventional treatment. So gonna close here real quick, um, kind of summarize. Um, again, the uh, finger weeders are commercially available. Uh, they're available from several manufacturers and typically you can buy a, a bolt-on attachment. Uh, you can see here in red, bolts onto a standard uh, toolbar or, or whatever kind of toolbar you might have. It is spring loaded, so that applies some down pressure uh, to the finger weeders. Um, and again, we, we've had pretty good uh, results with them, even in young cotton, seeing uh, what I would consider very good control of in-row weeds, uh, your small broadleafs, not as good at, on purslane or, or well-rooted grassy weeds. These systems cost about um, $1,000 per set. So it, it might be a, a something you might wanna look into uh, if you're interested in um, uh, improving your weed control. The side shift uh, hitch it is also commercially available. We've had uh, pretty good luck with it. It does, um, you know, you can put your cultivating tools closer to the crop plants, uh, control more weeds uh, in a pretty high percentage of them. The um, cost of these systems is um, kind of steep, about 35 grand per system. There are several manufacturers of these devices. They're all similarly priced and uh, performance, um, although we haven't tested it, I assume is uh, pretty comparable. Um, these systems have been around for quite some time and um, the manufacturers pretty much have them uh, proven out. So with that, I'd like to close and apologize again for the uh, technical difficulties. The, I was looking forward to showing you the videos, but um, <clears throat> anyway, I'd like to uh, end there and uh, try and answer any questions people might have. Anybody got any questions for Mark? Okay, we move forward, please. Next, we have uh, we have Pedro Andrade who's going to.
talk about uh, our see and spray or scan and spray technology. So if you're ready, Pedro, go ahead. Okay, so um, I just wanted to uh, recap on a few points that Blaze and, and Mark made, and that is um, we are moving into integrating more, more options. We believe that the more options there are, the more flexible the, the system will be, the solutions that we will develop will be so that um, we can have good control, good um, um, weed control. And, and it's likely not gonna be a single piece of equipment or a single option. It will be a, a, an integrated management not only from the machine side that Mark and I work with, but with many other parameters that will be part of agronomy, agronomy uh, water management, and many others. Okay, so for what's related to um, sensor control or see and spray uh, technology for spot spraying, uh, I wanna start with this slide uh, from Bosch and uh, they're talking about these benefits that there are on spot spraying. Uh, they call it smart spraying for, for a good reason. Um, it says that it's environmental protection, one of the main um, benefits, but then it's the topic that Blaze uh, elaborated on that is to avoid herbicide resistance. So, uh, which is a main uh, motivation for our work in cotton in Arizona. And of course, there is an economical benefit too with a reduction on herbicide use. So it, we, not only we protect the environment, but we save money. Um, in this diagram, what you see is, is this concept of spraying only the weeds, only certain uh, plants that are in the, in the, in the field. Uh, but the other thing that you can see, um, not so clear in this one, but in other slides that I have is that we don't we don't spray herbicides on fallow land. Um, it's not a practice that we we use in Arizona, or at least it's not a common practice. So, the, what you see in this uh, big sprayer with a very very long boom and so many nozzles and and sensors. Actually, what we're looking into is what's our system uh, composed of and and. And, and adapt to that size and row configuration. That's critical for our work. So let me talk first about the need. Uh, this is documented in many, many ways, the benefits too, in, in terms of savings, but I'm gonna bring this from the, from the element of the need to have technology that is selected. That's gonna be applying herbicide only when there is weeds. This particular field in Yuma, Arizona, we scan it. And, and um, what we did uh, to some uh, classification is that we separated those, those areas, and in this case are presented by circles, um, where we only have crop, no weeds, just the crop. And that is uh, the, what's on red, pink, and yellow. And the other colors, which is the green all the way to the purple, those are a mixture of the crop plants and the weeds. So only from that perspective, very, very general, you see that there is tremendous variation. So we can target. It makes sense to have a targeting system that will be um, acting when, um, when uh, there is a need for, for, uh, for sprayer. In our situation, we think that that is, that's got to be a row by row um, situation. So individual uh, rows to be treated. So that is some kind of a background. Let me continue with background and now explain the technology itself. This um, slide, this image has come from, from Weed Seeker, uh, used to be called, and this be manufactured by a company called Entech, and now it's uh, Trimble. It is a Trimble product. 
And you can see there that is the, the principle is illustrated fairly simple. On the left, there is number one with some light that is um, directed towards the plant. Number two is what amount of that light bounces back. The difference between those two amounts that are recorded and, and processed very, very quickly is what determines the status of the spray nozzle, which is number four. So when there is detection, the nozzle has, will, will receive an instruction on time to open. It's a solenoid control um, system. So solenoid will, will open and will spray that, that particular weed. Okay, so simple in, in that regard. Um, it is not necessarily simple in its operation. And, and we found significant challenges on, on how to implement it in Arizona, right? The image on the right is, is kind of nice where you see this uh, weed standing just right there and it's, it's, it's detected and it's a spray while the rest of the sensors are not spraying or the rest of the, of the nozzles in the nuclear boom are not, are not activated. So let me now give you a little bit of history that is in Arizona relevant to our cotton and our production system. So Bill McCloskey did a lot of work in the early 2000s with the weed seeker uh, system. And, and Bill had multiple objectives in his program, but one of those was to utilize these this, uh, sensors and this um, sensor control system on, on um, double cropping uh, systems and conservation tillage and, and other factors. So um, he made a lot of progress. He reported very, very meaningful savings in herbicide, upwards of 60% of herbicide use savings. But the main issue that he dealt with was the sensitivity of the sensor. It is a manual selection. So if you turn that knob to um, very, very sensitive, then it's very likely it will skip many weeds. If you reduce the sensitivity, then it becomes closer to a uniform application. So where is that balance? And back then the electronics of that system didn't, they, they didn't allow for more than, than that. Okay. Now, what we're seeing now, it's, it's uh, advances in, in that technology. And that's where we are jumping into this, this area to uh, understand how we can deploy them, how we can make benefit of those advances in our systems again. So there are new products. Um, you have those, those two images. Um, that's a weeded system built in Europe and the Trimble Weed Seeker 2 uh, built in, in the US, or it's an American brand. So um, what, what's new on these systems? is the same principle of operation. They're still active, they're still shining light to the, to the bottom and, and measuring what's reflected, but they operate with different parameters, uh, with different light uh, in, the, in, the, in the spectrum at different points. So they're different, but in a sense, they're very similar in their, in their uh, principle of operation. There's a newer system just released by John Deere back in March, I believe, and that is the, the CN spray where their system uses a camera. And uh, we had a meeting with, with the guys from, from John Deere and, and they have tested their systems uh, moving at 12 miles an hour and uh, not missing weeds that are quarter of an inch in diameter. So it's very impressive and also it's all based on the algorithms, uh, but that is a camera based system. It's an imaging system, whereas these two are reflectance-based uh, sensors. So great improvements on weed detection. That is, that is the, the main thing that I'm bringing with the newer models. And that is uh, they adjust their sensitivity automatically. That's, that is the improvements that come with um, more computing, computing power and algorithms uh, in the firmware. So, but again, um, Interestingly enough, both of those pictures are from a open field condition, whether it's fallow or there's something uh, there, something green. Uh, 
we want to use them in our row crop operations for cotton. So uh, we need to work on hardware configurations, how we want to distribute those sensor heads. Is it one per row or two per row, for instance? That's that will be one question. Um, uh, shield, we think that by improving on the shield of the crop and moving it away from the center, uh, we can expose a larger section of the furrow and, uh, and, the, plat and the part of the, of the bed where we can still spray and not be, um, and not be um, triggered by a cotton plant. We want to be triggered by weeds only. And many operational parameters that we need to, to test, uh, how fast the sprayer can go, for instance, that will be a very important parameter. And, and the, the height of the sensor will, will affect the field of view. So how wide is that swath that's been scanned? And also it, it, it will reduce the signal strength. So it's gotta, we're looking for that medium that is the happy medium that can be, um, used in Arizona. So in 2020, we started this work and this is still fairly new. I call this preliminary work because we got this uh, particular sprayer uh, in October or yeah, September, October timeframe. So it was at the end of the season and we did as much testing as we could, but it was just so new. But uh, we, we tried it out and we did some work and this is the Again, this is just an image of the, of the field in Maricopa. We also took it to Safford and the Safford Ag Center. And that's where Randy Norton did the first evaluation. So what you see there on this graph chart is that percent of small weeds that, that are controlled, okay? So Randy decided to dedicate his, his evaluation to only those, those very small weeds. I think, he mentioned the size of, um, of a quarter, uh, 25 cent uh, coin. So we start the, the, the graphs from full on, I mean, it's uniform application. Of course, that killed every single weed that was in those, in those runs. But then we go from sensitivity one to sensitivity five, which is five levels. This particular system has five levels that, you can, that can be selected. Within those high levels, then the system operates on different algorithms. Um, and you see that there is a significant uh, decrease in uh, efficacy as we move to, um, to higher uh, number in the sensitivity. The number five means, means nothing. It's just a, it's the fifth, um, the fifth uh, sensitivity level. Okay? So it, it is always a trade-off you can save more uh, herbicide by, by going to a higher number in the sensitivity chart. Okay. And uh, you have better control if you are on the other side. So those were the initial results. Um, we also ran some tests here in Maricopa, where I am at the moment. And um, I didn't have the resources to do uh, counting of, of weeds. So uh, I implemented this system to, to measure the reflectance of the weeds. So that's what you see in the pictures of the, on, the, um, uh, on the left. And the, the picture in the middle shows you how we set up these shields to push away the cotton plants and, and what the sensor is, is um, registering it's exclusively what is in the middle of the furrow and not being affected by the vegetation of the cotton plants. And I ran a different analysis that turned out to be consistent with the results that Randy uh, obtained. So what I did is I, I evaluated this based on a near infrared or a red ratio. And the quantities that you see in the plot on the, on the right are simply the differences between before and after application. So if that difference, that delta is positive, it means that it, it, it ended with a condition of less weeds uh, uh, or less biomass on weeds at the end. And that's T1 
but then you could see T5 where it was totally the opposite. The uh, control was, was so deficient, then um, we have a substantially higher amount of weeds after um, in, our, in our scan after the application. But again, uh, let me repeat one, one point that I made. This is preliminary testing. We took this at the very end of the, of the year and, and we did what we could before the, the season was over. But our, our, um, our framework to work in 2021 is a, is a more comprehensive uh, system. So with that, I'll, I'll finish. Um, we, I want to recognize the, the funding from Cotton Incorporated and the Arizona Cotton Growers Association. And, and again, you guys know that um, you can reach me and reach any one of us, uh, Blaze, Kyle, uh, Iman, whoever. And, and fi one final comment, I, I wanna make sure that I, that I communicate this. Um, we will report the results of our, of our work. We are in the middle of putting together hardware and getting systems ready for the field. So uh, I, I ask for your patience, but in 2021, we will develop um, um, more materials and, and share results. Blaze, that's, that's all I have. Well, thank you, Pedro. Anybody, anybody have any questions for Pedro? We're slim on questions today. All right, well, I would like to thank Iman and Kyle for giving us the time to talk about herbicide resistant weeds and, and control tactics. Uh, I'd also like to briefly mention that we will be working on mapping resistant Palmer populations throughout the state this summer. So we're gonna be looking pretty much after lay-by throughout the state to see where there are obvious populations still present in fields that aren't gonna be able to be controlled. Um, and we're gonna map those populations out. <clears throat> And we're going to try to increase education about resistant uh, resistant weeds and resistant Palmer amaranth throughout the state as well. Uh, and to do that work, I'd like to I'd like to thank Arizona Cotton Research Protection Council, who's going to be assisting me in the mapping and and giving me the the baseline maps to work with. Uh, Arizona Cotton Growers, uh, Arizona Pest Management Center, Corteva, BASF, NextGen, and Bayer, who are all either providing knowledge. Uh, and support for this or financial funding for for this work we appreciate it and you know we couldn't do it with all your help i'd also like to thank kevin caffrey and, and bill mccloskey obviously they're two weed scientists that are paramount in, in really helping accumulate this information and disperse it to all of you and make sure it's uh, legitimate and, and good so uh, i thank everybody for helping us with this and i really you know charge all the growers and pest control advisors to keep pushing pre-emergent herbicide, multiple uh, chemistries across the season, rotating chemistries from season to season, and really, really destroying all those escapes that are in the field. Because uh, like I mentioned earlier, the problem's only getting worse and worse. So let's uh, make a full-fledged effort to, to handle it. And with that, I'm in, uh, thank you, and uh, turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you. So, 